This is episode 11 of the History of Podcast. I'm Robert. And I'm Emma. And today we will be talking about common words and phrases. The history of common words and phrases. Now let me just say before we dive right into this wonderful episode, let me just promote our YouTube channel and our Instagram. Our YouTube channel is titled The History of. Our link, The link for it's in the show notes. And then our Instagram is called the history of podcasts and you should totally check it out uh but first before we get into the uh into the show as always we have the egg card and count oh yes and today's egg card and count is still 14 oh. uh because uh-uh. yeah actually to give you a little little inside we're recording this a little early getting ahead yeah today's actually monday and this is going to be released on saturday so we're keeping it in the can we are yeah so our goal is to keep the number of egg cartons we have above our episode number so we have 14 and we're episode 11 so catching up but we're doing okay we're doing okay right now yeah um yeah today's episode will be a slight diversion from the usual just heads up but hey that's what we're all about We have five words um, and phrases uh, that I found to be departures from the typical pattern of English. I know I just sounded like an English English professor. Yes, you do. But I'm I'm interested in this stuff, and I hope you are too. So the five words we're going to talk about are maybe, please, dude, okay, and right. Our first word is maybe. Now, maybe is an adverb, but have you ever thought about the possibility that maybe is just the words may and be cemented together? I mean, really, it's what it looks like. Now, may is a modal verb, which is a type of auxiliary verb, and be is also an auxiliary verb. In the words of my eighth grade English teacher, they are not action verbs, but state of being verbs. And when you put the two together, it almost works. I'll give you a couple of example sentences to show you what I mean. Is the sandwich shop open? Maybe. Or you could say, it may be. Another example sentence. Maybe the sandwich shop is open. You could also think of that as, It may be that the sandwich shop is open. Because a couple of extra words had to be added to that, it leads me to think maybe just evolved into its own word and eventually no longer needed to be sandwiched by those two lovely words, it and that. Sadly, there isn't really any documentation of the exact time that this change was made, but we can be sure that the English language fused those two words together at some point, maybe. Okay, number uh, word number two is please. And uh, it used to be the case that the magic word was only used by serfdom, speaking to nobility. They were supposed to treat the upper class with great courtesy and respect. But, of course, we throw it around so much today that it's almost lost its weight and meaning. Um, And now we're we're expected to say please. It's not anything special. Um, And according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the adverb form of please means to have the kindness. For example, if Emma were to say, Will you please open this for me? You could also think about the sentence as, Will you have the kindness to open this for me? I know that sounds kind of weird, but we never really give a second thought to it uh, when, we, when we say this. And as far as uh, where this word came from, I have a couple of ideas. Um, the reason I wanted to research the history of please in the first place is I am an enthusiastic uh, student slash speaker of French. And I discovered recently that to say please in French literally translates to if it pleases you. And I know uh, some things get lost in translation, but this one is pretty straightforward. Um, And so to say that in French, uh, you would say s'il vous plaît. Uh, If in the formal, uh, the informal would be s'il te plaît. So yeah, there's your your little uh, French lesson for today. And uh, think about taking this back to English. We've Have we just replaced uh, saying, if it pleases you, with the simple please? It's just like a shortened version. And it works in, ex- in an example. Uh, can you open this if it pleases you? Um, also, in Spanish, uh, please is por favor. Emma knows Spanish. Just a little bit. A l- well, a lot better than I do. Um, I don't speak Spanish, but uh, with some Google Translate, I've learned that uh, por favor literally translates to, and Emma, if I'm getting this wrong, uh, translates to by favor, or in other words, out of your kindness. So really, 
when I slap please onto the end of a command, uh, it's supposed to become a polite request, but it's actually a command disguised as a polite request. How many of how many of us are guilty of that? I've I've done that at least once, I know. Yeah. Number three, uh, word number three is dude. Uh, now, dude can mean, uh, quote, a man extremely fastidious in manner, uh, in dress and manner, uh, or a city dweller unf- unfamiliar with life on the range, especially an Easterner in the West. Mm. I think these two definitions are tied into each other. Uh, it's pretty easy to imagine a person uh, who would fit both of these definitions. Oh, yeah. Uh, some think that the uh, the man in fastidious dress definition came out of New York um, in the mid to late 1800s as a slang shortened version of Yankee Doodle Dandy. Uh, that doesn't help explain the, the spelling, though. Um, but however, the oddly classic Yankee Doodle song was actually in England way before it made its way to New York. It was sung by British soldiers during the American Revolutionary War to mock the Americans. You know, with the the macaroni sounds so oh. sar- sounds so sarcastic. Um, yeah. And you know how when sometimes if someone gets on your nerves, you try to become the exact opposite of them. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Uh, and this was the case with the aesthetics movement in England. Aesthetics. So those English, uh, those English soldiers were so uh, crass and crude. Um, and to s- offset the crass and crudeness of uh, some of the soldiers, uh, some people, primarily men, started dressing in overly extravagant clothing and lived by a principle of the appreciation of art. Uh, these men were referred to as dudes. <laughs> and that's actually where the first uh, definition comes from. You know, that first definition, man in fastidious dress. These men were like totally decked out, like not pract- not even a little bit practical at all. It, they looked kind of crazy. Um, but of course, today, we don't give any thought to the definition 99% of the time uh, of, you know, the origin of dude when we say it. All we really uh, care about is that it generally refers to men. Yeah, normally when I think of the word dude, I think of the exact opposite of like, you know, a very nicely dressed person. I think of someone it's, just chilling. It's you know, interesting hey, how words evolve over time. I know, right? Okay. Word number four. Okay. Okay is used in place of all right, and it is primarily an adjective or adverb. For example, to use it as an adjective, one might say, How are those other podcasts that are trying to keep up with the history of doing? Then, one might respond, Oh, they're okay. To use this as an adverb, I might say, This mic is working okay. About the history of the word, or abbreviation. We'll talk about that. There are a few different explanations. The first and probably most famous one is that in the late 1830s, specifically 1839, intentionally misspelled abbreviations were quite popular among journalists, writers, and the like. At the Boston Morning Post, several of these abbreviations came up, like OW, which stood for All Right, spelled O-L-L space W-R-I-G-H-T. I know, weird. However, none of this jargon really stuck for the long term, except for okay, which stood for all correct. So it's spelled O-L-L and then K-O-R-R-E-C-T. I don't know. And there it is. That's story number one. There are a couple of other explanations that come from various places, but aren't quite as clear as that first one. For example, in Martin Van Buren's campaign for presidency, he promoted the, his nickname Old Kinderhook or OK, but he definitely wasn't the first one to use OK. Other explanations include the telegraph abbreviation for open key and even a slang term for biscuits during the Civil War. To make things even more confusing, the Greeks, French, Scots, and even Choctaw Indians have their own versions of OK. However, you can imagine that the origin of these words are nearly impossible to pinpoint, making dating extremely sketchy. So, we stick to the first story because it occurred early on and has excellent documentation. Okay, and our fifth and last word of this episode is right. Uh, Right can mean opposite of left, but among other things, it can also mean correct. 
and those who give driving directions know this to be very important. Do I need to turn right? Or do I need to turn left? Right. Don't do not do that. Quite confusing. Yeah. Uh, regardless of driving instructions, uh, we do know that right uh, can also mean just, upright, or fair. An example would be, do the right thing. It looks like this morally straight definition of right morphed or evolved over time into the correct definition of right. The word is similar among different old or ancient languages. For example, in Old Saxon, it's right, so it's spelled R-E-H-T. Ret. I think it's ret. 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 Okay. And in Latin, it's rectus. And, of course, by the time English came around, it was right, right? The first known use of the word right to mean correct was in the was in the 1580s to say, am I not right? From there, that definition gradually materialized into how we most commonly use the word today. This was reinforced by the popularization of saying right on in the 60s. Uh, and it's actually, it's, it's amazing to think that the most common definition of a word today is not actually the original meaning. And quick side note, when you add right uh, in a question, right, uh, to the end of uh, your sentence, it implies that you don't know what you're talking about. That's your uncertain, yeah. Please avoid that. And sometimes it can even get uh, self-contradictory when you say, I know, right? Do, do you know or do you not know? It's, it's a bad one. Don't fall into that. Right. And uh, before <laughs> we go, uh, to go along uh, with that side note, I have a warning to my generation. So this, this could be thought of as an epilogue to the episode. In the book 1984, George Orwell predicts a frightening future. The characters live with virtually no physical or mental freedoms in a land called Oceana, and there is a developing language called Newspeak. The entire objective of Newspeak is to continually decrease the vocabulary, and the characters find themselves using abbreviations, shortened grammar, and words that aren't really words. And my message to you is not to fall into the trap of Newspeak. The English language, along with all other languages, is a toolbox of communication, and words are the tools. Modern communication has been so terribly degraded because the majority of us overuse the wrong tools. So, go and take full advantage of articulating your thoughts with the best tools possible. Your effectiveness and intentionality in communication is an exceptionally valuable thing, so don't throw it away. Language is a blank canvas, and you are the artist. Do yourself and others a favor and make your use of language a masterpiece of communication. If you have any questions or comments uh, about the information provided in this episode, or if you have any uh, episode topic suggestions, please contact us at thehistoryof365 at gmail.com. Have a blessed day. And you've got to promise me something. Never stop learning.